Our second speaker this afternoon is Andrew Despy. Andrew's the manager of Emerging Technology Enterprise Services Commonwealth Bank. Now he works for a bank, but the, but, but the presentation he's going to give is all about those technologies that, that help make life better. Uh, Andrew currently leads the bank's exploration of ag tech, IoT, and machine, machine economy. He's going to talk about the impact of technology on humanity. Please welcome Andrew. <clears throat> Give you that one. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, right, I'd like to first of all start by acknowledging the land um, which gives us everything. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge all of the traditional owners and also all of the elders past, present and future who preserve and nurture such a wonderful culture. So um, I'm going to be doing something a bit different today, I guess. Uh, not something I've done before, uh, so forgive me if this is a bit out there, but I thought it's worthwhile to take a step back. So uh, my name is Andrew Despy. I work in the Emerging Technology team at Commonwealth Bank. Um, my role is to identify and experiment with technologies that will radically alter the status quo in financial services over the next five to 20 years. But today, I'd like to talk about more than financial services. In fact, I'd like to argue that the world needs an internet of everything, like really needs it. So um, all technologies obviously uh, are a double-edged sword, but I think on balance the internet of things is going to make the world a better place for humanity and for all life. So why is it important that we talk about this? Isn't it obvious? Isn't that why we're all here today? Um, well, I think Sometimes technology just sort of happens to us. Um, you know, technology eats up the world all around us and everybody just adopts it and you kind of go, everyone else is using it, I need to use this technology, otherwise I'm gonna fall behind. Thanks for the lights. Um, so, um, so I think it's always important to take a step back, right, and to actually understand why we're adopting technology, what effect is it having on the world, what effect is it having on us, and how should we best use it. Um, but uh, before I get to the Internet of Things, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to go a little bit philosophical. Um, this is one of our ancestors, Homo erectus. People like her, about two million years ago, for the first time, left Africa. And they really harnessed the use of tools. They became dependent on tools for their well-being and for their prosperity. They domesticated fire, and so they felt more comfortable and safe. And um, they really, really um, changed the game for, for humanity because the way that they adopted technology meant that they started to co-evolve with technology. And so since then, since we've started adopting technology into our everyday lives, we've become one with it. So, you know, we've seen a great exoskeleton just then, which is a great example of transhumanism. But in fact, what I want to argue is that we're all transhumans and we always have been. We don't really make sense as a species without technology. So uh, Homo erectus left Africa. And um, I, love, I love this diagram because it summarizes so many things in one picture. Um, about 500,000 years ago, people figured out how to not just domesticate fire, but to actually use it for cooking. And that actually is probably one of the most important moments in the history of humanity. Um, that led to Homo heidelbergensis, and from that moment onwards, we went through a second phase of colonizing the planet. Um, and this time, as you can see on this diagram, we wiped out everything that stood before us. So, Homo sapiens, pretty smart species. But 100,000 years ago, something happened. Something that's called the cognitive revolution. Now, nobody knows exactly what that was, what caused it. It's quite likely that it was the development of modern speech 
which enabled us to tell stories and to have common myths, such as this one about the Internet of Things. Um, and um, um, at this point, through our use of technology, we really started to change the landscape around us. We perfected using controlled fires, so we started to actually manage the landscape using fire at a grand scale. We um, started wearing clothes so we could live pretty much anywhere. We started getting really good at hunting in groups so we could pretty much take down any animal. And so as we spread across the world, we literally wiped everything out. And that process is still happening. Then about 10,000 years ago, we had the agricultural revolution. And then we went to space. Well, to be fair, mainly our technology went to space. As Kevin Kelly says, humans are the reproductive organs of technology. Um, so why is, this, why is this a big deal? I mean, this exponential thing that everyone's talking about, that's on everyone's lips, the exponential age, exponential technology, um, it's been happening this whole time. The, the curve started a long time ago. We've been on this curve for a very long time. Um, but the thing that's different now is that for the first time, we can actually direct this evolution. We can actually be in control of this evolution. It's no longer just something that's emerging out of our behavior and out of our environment. So a really good example of that is a guy called Chris Dancy. Chris um, is known to the media as the world's most connected man. He prefers to be called the mindful cyborg. And uh, in about 2008, um, he was fairly obese, uh, had a pretty terrible lifestyle, and only ate junk food. And he made a decision that he wanted to make a change in his life. And so what he did was he said, you know, if I want to make a change in my life, I need to actually understand my life first of all. So he started collecting all this data. And he started wearing wearables. He started making use of Internet of Things and sensors. He ended up with about 700 systems monitoring his life. It's pretty crazy. He took the idea of the quantified self to the extreme, right? Um, and he used that data. He didn't just collect it for the sake of collecting it. So he ran analytics, and he started to understand his daily patterns, um, you know, the relationship between his behaviors and outcomes to his health, and so on. And then he ended up looking like this. Um, now, now, what he's doing is he's focusing on using the technology that he's used to improve his physical well-being to improve his mental well-being. So, um, for example, he... Uh, hacks time, as it were. I know that's like a very Silicon Valley term. But basically what he does is he sets himself notifications. He only gets notifications from himself. And they're based on his location, they're based on time, they're based on his activity, like whether he's walking, whether he's running, because he's still wearing enough sensors to do that. Um, he, for example, uh, was monitoring the, um, the decibel levels around him. And so he connected up the sensors to his house, and if he raised his voice above a certain level, the lights in his room would dim to remind him to be more calm. Um, seems crazy, but it's worked. It actually worked. Um, and he's, he was connected to all these sensors, decibel level, um, light, <clears throat> how much light there was in the room. And at one point, he got rid of all those sensors because he didn't need them anymore. He had augmented himself with Internet of Things, and afterwards, he still retained that ability. Now, if he's in a room, he can tell you exactly what the decibel level is without needing any special sensors. Um, and as I said, he calls himself Mindful Cyborg, uh, and people laugh at the whole cyborg thing. But we are all cyborgs. The average person unlocks their phone 80 times a day. The average person looks at a screen for seven hours a day. And that's the average person. I think we all know people who are way more hardcore than that, right? So now, imagine if you were to extrapolate this, this idea of the quantified self to our entire planet. Internet connectivity will soon span the entire globe. 
right? Especially if uh, companies like Fleet Space have uh, anything to do with it. The marginal cost of internet connectivity is approaching zero. The internet of everything will eventually be like the planet's nervous system, a way for the entire planet to know itself. You can't manage what you can't measure. You can't automate what you can't digitize. And so to me, this is a really beautiful vision. You hear so much about fourth industrial revolution, industry 4.0, Artificial intelligence, internet of things, quantum computing, distributed ledgers, connecting all these things, machine to machine economy. It all seems pretty amazing. So what's, what's wrong? Well, by the time we get to 2030, there will be eight and a half billion people on the planet. Um, the rate of urbanization will be three times what it is today. Right now, there are 800 million people who are living in hunger, and I'm sorry, I, I, I still think it's a problem. One third of our food is wasted. 70% of the planet is covered in ocean, but only 2% of our food comes from the ocean. 95% of all water that we use goes down the drain. Just think about that. 800 million people in the world don't have access to clean water. 36 million people in the world die every year from preventable lifestyle diseases. At the same time, we've got 4 billion people who are not yet connected to the internet, even though 95% of the world's population has mobile phone coverage. 80% of our resources, of our energy, still come from non-renewable resources. And I don't know if this touches your heart, but since 1970, 50% of all animals on the planet have disappeared in terms of biomass, wild animals. So um, that's pretty grim, isn't it? Especially when it's in black and white. So, uh, ta-da! Um, I'm curious, how many of you uh, have heard of the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Hands up. A few of you. How many of you are working on something that is actually related to one of these UN Sustainable Goals and you may not have even been aware of it before? A yeah, few of you. How many of you are working on problems that can have a global impact? Nice. So I think that's really good, that's actually not bad. But I think in Australia we don't too often think about these sort of things. Um, I think um, it's pretty obvious how the Internet of Things can address a lot of these problems, right? Now you can very easily argue that the Internet of Things could make a lot of these problems worse. And as I said, the whole point is that we can actually shape the future and we can direct technology to serve us rather than us serving it. But if you think about everything from using the Internet of Things to reduce food waste, to optimize supply chains, whether it's food or any kind of resource so that there's minimized waste in the way that we use resources, to manage and understand our use of water, for example, um, it's pretty easy to think about how IoT can make a big difference in the world. So, this is what I want to leave you with. I think the Internet of Things can definitely make the world a better place. But the most important goal out of all of the goals on this screen is number 17. Number 17 is collaboration. And I think if you look around in this room and at this conference, it's full of amazing people doing really great things who are really activated and engaged. And if we actually talk to each other, and talk in the context of what problems in this world can we solve, then I think next year when this next summit comes around, we'll be able to all get up on stage and talk about our success stories, about how Australia really is a global leader in the Internet of Things. Thanks very much.